Please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> and beginning to read from verse 8. The grace wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. And we're looking at these a few verses uh, this morning, and we have begun this series on this wonderful book of uh, Ephesians, and we continue now with our third uh, study, and my title for this morning's message is God's Plan for Believers. God's Plan for Believers. I'm sure you're all used to hearing sometimes believers say, God has a, a plan uh, for your life. Well, that's true. God has, usually people when they say that, they're thinking about a personal plan, I think, uh, rather than this overall plan. But yes, God has a personal plan for believers. But here we are considering something much broader, something much greater than an individual's personal plan. God's plan for life. God's plan for believers. And we've begun to look at this a long sentence of Paul, which begins in verse 3 and goes all the way down to verse 14 in the Greek. And it's an amazing uh, piece of writing, and it's full of uh, encouragement and uh, the exaltation of God. And we, we see here in these uh, these verses from verse 3 to 14, God's plan beginning in eternity past, beginning in Him, choosing and electing a certain number of people, and then adopt, uh, 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 determining, predestinating them to be adopted into His family by Christ coming into this world and giving Himself on the cross, not for everyone in the world, but for that elect group which were chosen uh, in eternity past, dying for them, and then the Spirit of God coming, and this is what we'll be looking at today, the Spirit of God taking that work of Christ and applying it to each individual person that was chosen and bringing them through uh, to, to the Lord. Without the Holy Spirit's working, none of us would have come to Christ. None of us would have uh, come to know the Lord. We may have known about the, the, the cross. We may have known about Jesus dying on the cross. But unless the Holy Spirit came and worked individually with us to enlighten us and show us these things and the meaning of them and how we needed these things, and He brought us, uh, uh, enlightened us, unless He had done that, we would never have come uh, to Him. And so we are so grateful to this amazing plan of God. And it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say that an inheritance also has been predestined for God's people. All those whom He has called in, in eternity past, saved in time, will be saved uh, and go to glory into everlasting joys and happiness. So this is what we're looking at. And we, we see in election and adoption, we see specifically the work of the Father. God the Father is prominent in making the choice and adoption. 
And then we see in redemption, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, He is prominent. He comes to the fore. And now we see in this work of illumination and bringing people to Christ, to trust in Christ, we see the work of the Holy Spirit. So that a Trinitarian salvation, a Trinitarian plan uh, that God has put into place. So we've looked at uh, last week at those first four blessings, election, and then adoption, and then acceptance uh, in Christ, and then redemption uh, in Christ as well. So today we look at the fifth blessing here, which is illumination. In verse 8 or verse 9, uh, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. God has made known to us believers the mystery of his will. The mystery of his will. What's that? Oh, it's his plan of redemption. What I've just mentioned uh, to you. This plan that we are uh, thinking of from its initial point in eternity past all the way through uh, to glory. And, that, and, and on that last day, that final day, when all things will be made subject to Jesus Christ. Things are not so now, but there is coming a day when everything will be brought and made subject to Him. The past, the present, and to a great degree the future has been revealed, has been shown uh, to the believer. This is what Paul is saying here. Having made known unto us, made known to the believer. If I'm a believer, God has shown me these things. God has revealed to me His plan. You are initiated into His plan. You are given this uh, special knowledge. But why does it say the mystery of His will? Well, the way that we use the term today is uh, somewhat different. When we say uh, mystery, we may talk about something which is unexplainable. We talk about the mysteries of uh, outer, outer space. We cannot explain everything that's going on. Or we may use the term mystery in the sense of a puzzle or a murder mystery. There's, you know, we cannot re there are different uh, bits of, of the jigsaw and you have to put them all together and you have to try and resolve that mystery. And that's the way we tend to use that word. But the Bible uses it, mystery, in a different way. The, way the, the meaning of the word here, mystery, means something which is hidden, something which is concealed, something uh, which is secret. And it's uh, talking about the will of God, the plan of God, is uh, here, the, is something which is hidden, something really which is known only to God, something which is hidden in his heart. It is something in his thoughts, in his mind, and it's concealed there, and it's only, ma it's only made known uh, to those whom he chooses to make it known to. It's just like ourselves, isn't it? You, may, you have your thoughts, and unless you choose to tell me your thoughts, I will never know. You can keep your thoughts to yourself if you want to, and you have a choice whether you reveal it to me or not. And it's the same here idea with God. God has his own thoughts. He keeps it uh, to himself if he chooses. But he, we read here that he has chosen to reveal it, not to everyone, but chosen to reveal it to those who are saints, those who are believers uh, in, uh, in Christ. God has made known these things. Hidden from the unbeliever, that's the other side of it, kept from the unbeliever. Oh, he may know something about it, he may have some knowledge about it, but the unbeliever cannot really perceive the worth and the value of this gospel and this plan. He may have a, a factual knowledge, of, yes, we, God, Christ came into the world, and he may be able to think about that, but he, he doesn't have any spiritual perception and appreciation for these things. Let me give you a couple of verses. Matthew 11 and verse 25. Uh, the Lord said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them 
and to babes. And then again, uh, when uh, the, the Lord said, Whom do men, he asked his disciples, Whom do men say that I am? And uh, Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you remember the Lord's answer. The Lord said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. He didn't come to that knowledge by his own understanding. It was a revelation. It was given to him. The word revelation is very interesting. The word revelation is it's like the picture of a curtain being drawn back and you can see everything that is behind the curtain. And that was, that's what God does with his plan for believers. He reveals his plan. He draws back the curtain from their eyes so that they can see what he is doing in their lives and in uh, this world. Amazing uh, privilege uh, that we have, but hidden from uh, the, 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 the lost. As Paul said also in first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 2, our gospel is hid from those who are lost. And then again in our reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, we often attribute this verse to heaven. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And it's okay to do that, to, uh, to apply that to heaven. But it's also talking about the things of God. It's saying that uh, the next verse says, but God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. So we know what God has revealed to us. These are not things that are only for the future, only for heaven. There are many things also God, in his, through his word, reveals to us by his Spirit. So the believer has this privilege of being initiated into the mystery of God's will. He knows. You are a believer today, friends. You know more than a university professor. You know more than a prime minister, if he doesn't know the Lord. You know a lot more than he does. You understand a lot more about this world and why it is than he does. You know the, a better way even to fix the world's problems because uh, you know the gospel really is the answer. The purposes of God are hidden from the unbeliever but are revealed uh, to you. They're undiscoverable. The, the unbeliever can, uh, maybe he can think about these things but he, he cannot by human reason get at them. He cannot by human reason understand them and spiritually, they are spiritually discern things. The natural man cannot discover them. But this understanding is given to the simple believer who trusts in Christ. Whoever they are, whether uh, they're a cleaner in the streets or in, in the office, or there are, uh, the, the, these things are revealed uh, to them if they uh, uh, trust in the Lord. And so we read also, going back in verse 8, he has communicated his plan to us in all wisdom and prudence. The word wisdom, well, really just saying that the knowledge is imparted uh, to us. The knowledge of the gospel and an understanding of it is given uh, to us. A, a, that spiritual perception we've mentioned of truth. And that realization that this is true, this gospel is true, the word of God is true. The Holy Spirit is illuminating you to help you to see how God has dealt with the problem of sin. How God has, through the cross, otherwise the cross would mean nothing to people. Many people just see the cross of Christ as a good work or a good example, a demonstration of love of Christ. Of course it's that. But it's much more. It's much more than that. It's uh, understanding that there the Lord Jesus was paying the price for his people's uh, sin. And we see the wisdom of God that's also revealed to us. How God was at the cross uh, satisfying his justice and at the same time making a way for, uh, for him to be merciful. Justice and peace, we say, has kissed each other at the cross. Because there, God in his great wisdom was answering and resolving uh, the problem of how uh, to bring people uh, to himself, how to save uh, sinners. 
And we see not only, not only do we perceive it, but we see the excellence of it. We say in ourselves, this is wonderful. This is tremendous, what God has done. This is great. This is, we, we see how amazing this plan of salvation is. And we say to ourselves as believers, there's nothing like it. How wonderful is God? How amazing is our God? So when we are enlightened in such a way, when God shines into our hearts in this way, uh, he, uh, we're able to see things clearly. In wisdom it says, and also in prudence. And that's simply, friends, the practical use that we make of the gospel. One thing to know it, one thing to understand it, but we must take it, we must apply it uh, to our lives. And again, this is the Lord's doing. He helps us to take by faith what Christ has done for ourselves. And he, in a practical way, it makes a change in our life. We're brought to repentance. We're brought to uh, turn away uh, from our sins and to yield our lives back to God as a practical work, working out of this wisdom that God has given. It's not just sitting here in my mind, but it's affecting my life and how I live. And then it, that prudence goes on because I'm continually adjusting my life to fit in with God's Word. I would never do that. If I was just an unbeliever, I would never do that. I would, I would never think about changing my life to fit in with, with, with the truth. But when God shines into our hearts, this is what He does. He gives us understanding and He gives us that prudence to respond to it and to uh, take it and apply it to ourselves. Before conversion, well, we, by nature, we were ignorant of these things. We didn't know these things. We were unable to discern really the value of it and the need of it. But when the Spirit of God comes, He, he illuminates us. We have that light bulb moment, that time when we can see our eyes are opened and we can see what we never saw before and we turn in repentance and faith uh, to Christ. Our lives change, our priorities change, our, prior our values change. No longer living now for this world. Now we've seen these things. It makes a difference in how I'm going to live my life. Now I'm living for Christ. I'm not going to follow the world. I'm not going to go after the sinful things in the world. Those are things I avoid. And my goal, my priority in life is now to honor God uh, day after day. Well, all this we read, verse 9 was according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. This, is what, this was the kind intention. This is the sovereign purpose that was in God's heart from eternity past. But look in verse 10, friends, at his God's ultimate purpose, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. <coughs> God is a gathering together in one, all things in Christ. Order and harmony that we do not see now in our world will be restored at that last day, at that final day when Christ returns, and that final age which will last forever and ever, Order and harmony will be restored under Christ, under His rule, under His reign. He will reign not for 70 years. He will reign forever and uh, forever. The original harmony we know, when we, look at, well, when we look at our world, we see there's so much disarray. There's so much disorder in society. And we see uh, so many things amiss. And all this is the result of the fall. And the great scattering that came about as a result of the fall. And man became a rebel when he fell. And he uh, turned against God. Uh, but God had moved uh, to restore that order. And God is, mo has mo is moving to bring all things uh, that have been scattered, all things back again under the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ on that last day. 
He gathers together all the elect, all those who have trusted in Christ before He came in the Old Testament period, and all those since He has come and who have trusted in Christ, all those believers will be gathered together, never to be scattered again uh, from Him, but uh, uh, kept uh, under uh, His rule in Christ. This is uh, His doing. But it also says here, not only the things which are uh, on earth, but also the things which are in heaven. What are those things? So we, on the one hand, those things on earth, we talk about the believers, those in paradise, and those uh, who are still remaining on the earth will be gathered together. What about the things which are in heaven? What does that refer to? Well, we believe it refers to, friends, the elect angels, those who, uh, those who owe their permanent standing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know, we believe that a third of the angels rebelled against God and they fell and became devils, but there were uh, uh, two-thirds, we could say, who uh, s stayed faithful uh, to God. Well, but there is still this possibility, this liability in, in them. They may fall, just like the others did. They may uh, go away from God. But this verse tells us because they are in Christ, they will be kept from falling. They will not lose, in a sense, their status uh, in heaven. So they also owe their security, their permanent security in heaven to Christ, just like we do. We owe our security and our salvation to Christ. So also those elect angels who didn't fall, they also uh, are fixed in that permanent state because of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you can see what I'm getting at uh, there. But all things, angels and the saved, brought uh, to Christ in that final uh, day. Friends, uh, we must have this God's plan, God's purposes. We must keep these things in our mind. Paul here is writing uh, from Rome. He's uh, a, a soldier. A Roman soldier is uh, chained uh, to him. He's under house arrest, as it were. But he doesn't allow these things to trouble him and bother him. He's not in any disarray himself. He's not wondering, oh, where is God? What's he doing? Why am I under house arrest? Why can't I go out and preach the gospel? Why is all this happening to me? He doesn't think like that because he has this plan in his mind, firmly fixed in his mind. He knows that even through such terrible things as his imprisonment, God is working out his purposes. And it should be the same for us. We live in this disordered and rebellious world and sometimes it's overwhelming when we see what's going on around us and we may be tempted to ask, Lord, why are you not doing something about it? But He is. He is working out His plan. He is bringing, calling those elect people uh, to Himself. And when that final one is called in, then the end will come. And then the Lord will usher in uh, His uh, kingdom. So friends, this is an encouragement for us and how we owe, uh, owe these things to that illumination and lightening of the Spirit. But then sixthly, and uh, briefly, the, the next blessing we have, sixth blessing, is inheritance. In verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Every believer in Christ is given an inheritance. They are made an heir with Christ, a joint heir with Him. You know, when Israel entered Canaan, well, the promised land, each tribe was apportioned uh, land. This was their particular inheritance. And it's the same also for the believer. The believer too has a portion, but his portion is not physical land. His portion, as you know, is an eternal inheritance reserved for him in heaven, in glory. And the believer, when he passes from this life, he enters into that eternal inheritance. Heaven, uninterrupted happiness uh, there, nearness to God, nearness to Christ, feeling his love every moment, no interruption 
of His love and His kindness will be felt there in such an enlarged and wonderful way. A new place, your place is guaranteed uh, in that new earth if you trust in Christ. And you're given a new glorified body so that which will be accommodated to that new environment that you will be living, be living in. This is all part of your inheritance as a saint, as a believer, and uh, so much uh, more. Oh friends, the security of knowing that you will never lose uh, those blessings. You'll never be turfed out of heaven. Never lose your inheritance. People today may lose out for some reason or other, but it will never be taken away from you. It's reserved in heaven for you, uh, Peter says. And all this is due once again to the predestination, the determining beforehand of God's purpose who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And then verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory. What does that, that mean? Well, very simply, it means that God does all these things in us and for us that his name may be praised. God, in this marvelous plan, well, you, if you, when you look at it, you see his grace, the riches of His grace. You see His power in uh, saving us from Satan, bringing us out of the world to Himself. You see His kindness in treating us so gently and so wonderfully. You see all these things. You see His sovereignty in the plan. Who can say to Him, why are you choosing one and not another? He is sovereign. He is God. He can do as He chooses. Who am I to say unto Him, why are you doing these things? Or oh, you see, friends, his love in this plan, his wisdom, as we've mentioned already, and all these things are, are, are shown in the plan of God so that we will praise him, so that we will rejoice in him, exalt his name, and extol and magnify our great God. But then also in verse 12 and 13, we read something about those who have trusted in Christ. How can I be a partaker of this inheritance? How can I be sure that I will be in heaven and enjoy these blessings? Well, very simply, the answer is here. Trusting in Christ. Paul said here that they trusted in Christ and then also ye trusted in Christ after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. That's referring to the Ephesians and it's the same for us. The person who will enjoy this inheritance and these, all these spiritual blessings, beginning in this world and then continuing in the next, is simply those who trust in Jesus. Our oh, friends, let me ask you this very simple question. Do you trust in Christ? Do you have hope uh, in Christ? Can you say that Jesus Christ is your Savior, that He is your Lord, that you're hoping in Him for forgiveness, that you're hoping in Him for eternal life. You trust in no one else. You definitely don't trust in yourself. You've seen through all that, you've seen the vanity and the emptiness and the futility of trusting in yourself. And you've come to simply trust in His name and in His death on the cross. And you say, Jesus, I will trust Thee Trust thee with my soul, guilty, lost, and helpless. Thou canst make me whole. Have you done that, friends? That's it. You do that, and you're accepted with God, and uh, you, you are blessed with all these uh, spiritual uh, blessings. But let me uh, quickly uh, move on uh, to the final, <coughs> the final blessing mentioned in this passage. The seventh blessing here is the sealing with the Spirit. And I just want to explain uh, three words which are found here in verse 13. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His uh, glory. Three words about the sealing with the Spirit. Well, what is this sealing? You are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Well, it's not very difficult 
really to understand, friends. It's God putting a mark on those who believe in Christ. God putting his stamp on somebody when they turn to him and saying, he or she is my child now and they will always be uh, my child. This person who trusts in Christ belongs to me. That's the seal that is being referred to uh, here. And it's, if, you, if you go into the countryside, as I did uh, recently, uh, you will see many sheep in the fields and the sheep you know, have the, the stamp. Uh, sometimes blue, uh, there's a blue mark on, on their fleece or sometimes a red mark. And it's a sign of, of uh, who that she, those sheep belong to, which a farmer owns uh, those sheep. And uh, uh, that mark distinguishes them from others. And it's a similar kind of meaning here. Those whom God has sealed, God has put his stamp upon that person. But what is the seal? What exactly is that mark? Well, here it tells us the Holy Spirit of promise. God the, God, the Holy Spirit himself is the seal. The Spirit himself dwelling and abiding in the believer. This is the seal uh, of, the, of the Spirit. This is what marks out those who are true believers. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So the person who, uh, who is converted well, the Spirit of God dwells, comes to dwell in that person and they, you'll be able to see that in life. It's impossible for the Spirit of God to come into a person's life and you never see any change. No, when the Spirit comes, it will be uh, so evident. That person now becomes concerned about spiritual things. That person now begins to pray and prayer becomes a real engagement with God. They begin to read this, the Bible and the Bible comes alive uh, to that person. That person becomes sensitive to sin and uh, they're aware of these things and they, they try and avoid uh, sin and they begin to fight against sin. All these are marks that the Spirit of God has come to abide and live in a believer. He's one now who is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is his priority in life. But then look at the second word in verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance. The earnest. The earnest that means a pledge, a down payment or a deposit. So in, in, in these times, if a trader or somebody wanted to buy some land or something which was valuable and had agreed on the price uh, for that uh, land or for that uh, uh, a thing which they wanted to buy, well then he would, instead of paying it all, he would pay a deposit and as a guarantee that he would come back and pay the full amount uh, later. It was a, a, a deposit, a, a part of the payment. And it was, in those times it was such that uh, he had to pay, he was obliged to pay. He couldn't break off the agreement and say, well, maybe I've changed my mind and I won't buy that thing. You can do that today. You can break off, maybe you lose your deposit, uh, but you can't in those times, once you put down the down payment, once you put down that deposit, you had to complete the transaction. And that's what the word here, earnest, means. With the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance, the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchase possession. He's the guarantee uh, that he, uh, the believer will make it to heaven. He's the guarantee that God will not give up on that person. God will come back, as it were, and take that person uh, to glory. That believers, even now in this world, is safe and will be kept. So uh, that's our second word, earnest. And just one more, one more word, friends, and then I'm done. And that's in verse 13 as well. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And I, I just want to mention that last phrase, in whom also, after that ye believed. Because 
There are some people who misinterpret uh, this, uh, these words. There are people here who say that that's after is referring to another experience post-conversion. After you've come to faith in Christ, after you've be believed, they're saying you need this other experience of being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. A second blessing, it's often uh, called. A special blessing which will, oh, will take you up to a, a greater a height spiritually. A greater blessing which will make you, uh, give you a higher spiritual experience. And so what they do by saying these things is they're, they're creating two tiers of Christians. Ordinary Christians on one, one level and those who are higher up on, on another level. Those who have had this second uh, blessing. And it sad, unfortunately causes so much distress to those people who haven't that blessing. They think, I must strive, I must pray, I must seek this blessing more than anything. This is what I need. If only I can get that blessing, everything will be okay. The friends, that would be a misinterpretation. Because the word hereafter very simply means at the moment of conversion. After you, were, after you believed, at the moment you believed, then you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Every believer, when they are converted, has been sealed. There is no second blessing. You don't need to seek after another uh, blessing from God, the sealing at, 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 that, at another time. God gives all spiritual blessings to us the moment we come to Him and trust in Him. All believers are the same. All believers are equal in Christ. All of us have the Spirit of God. Well, friends, this is our message uh, this morning. The riches of God's grace. Let go back and think about these things. Meditate on them. That we are chosen, brought into God's family through Christ, redeeming us. Illuminated, enlightened in such a, a way that uh, we couldn't get at by our own human reason. Sealed with the Spirit and awaiting now that certain, sure and eternal inheritance and all will be to the praise of His glory. Let's uh, close by singing our final hymn, number 472. Fill thou my life, O Lord my God, in every part with praise. 472.